Hello and welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast. I am your host, Christine Worth. Now today we get into part four of the James Cron testimony in the Darley Routier trial. And in the previous episode, number 76, we heard all about the blood that was on the handle of the vacuum, the wheel tracks that were um, evidently taken from the vacuum that had gone through some blood. We heard all about the bloody footprints that were in the kitchen, as well as where some tread marks were found, which appeared to be a police officer had dragged some blood through the area on his shoes. We also learned the results of all of the fingerprints that they took, and it matched to nobody. Nowhere in the whole entire house did any of the fingerprints that they grabbed match anybody. So, we ended up last time, they had taken a break, and the jury is now back in the courtroom, and Mr. Cron's testimony is resumed, and again, it is still being conducted by the prosecutor at this point, Mr. Greg Davis. So let's start up where we left off. Mr. Cron, again, you had an opportunity to observe the window there in the garage where the screen was cut. Is that right? I did. Okay. Let me show you, sir, State's Exhibit number 42-C. Do you recognize that to be a photograph of the window? Yes. Is it a photograph of the window in its original position as you first saw it on June 6th, 1996? Yes. Does it also show some items near that window inside the garage? Yes. Is it a true and accurate depiction, sir? It is. Again, as we look at this photograph, do we see certain items inside the garage? Yes. Mr. Cron, have you had an opportunity before we came in the courtroom this morning to examine the window that has been marked as State's Exhibit 42? Yes. Mr. Cron, what I would like to do at this time is to place this window over here in front of the jury. And then I'm going to ask you to do certain things with it. All right? Yes. Okay. Okay, Mr. Cron, if you would step down here, please. And first of all, the outside of the window, is it facing toward the jurors at this time? It is. Okay. The inside of the garage portion is here toward the council table, right? Yes. All right. Would you please, looking at State's Exhibit 42-C, would you position the window itself in the open position that would match the position shown in State's Exhibit 42-C. That's approximately the height of the window in the picture. Okay, the open one. All right. Now, the screen that is in the window of 42, does it appear to be the same type of screen as shown in State's Exhibit 42-A? Yes. Could you demonstrate for the jurors what it would take to remove the screen on State's Exhibit 42? Yes, this screen is fairly common to open it. It has little tabs at the base that freeze the window from the slot at the base of the, the screen at the slot of the window frame. All right, there's little clips at the top of the frame that fit up into the window frame and helps hold it into position. Okay, let me just take that screen from you. And if you would, take State's Exhibit 42-A. Can you place that into the window? Yes. And then the witness then demonstrates. Okay, all right. They are easier to get out than they are to get in. That's for sure. All right. We have now got a reproduction of State's Exhibit 42. And now we have State's Exhibit 42-A, the screen in place in that window, right? Yes. Now, during the break, or sometime this morning, did you actually put some safety pins into the screen? I did. Okay. What was the purpose of doing that? The only, the purpose was to mark the original tear marks here in case we accidentally tore the screen. We would know the original position of where the cuts were really made. Okay. Now, if we look at the photograph, 
States Exhibit 42-C, do we see what appears to be some sort of an animal carrier or a cat carrier of some sort here? Yes. Am I showing you, I think it's actually called a litter pan here for cats. Am I holding what appears to be a similar type litter pan as shown in States Exhibit 42-C? Yes, it may be the same brand, but yes, it's very similar. Okay, if you would, if you could take this litter pan and position it in relation to the window as the litter pan is shown in 42-C. I don't know if I have enough room here. Just that is approximately the position there. Okay, and I'm going to mark this litter pan as States Exhibit 42-E, and I will offer it again just for demonstrative purposes only. We have now positioned the litter pan. Does there appear to be some sort of an animal cage next to the window also? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to ask you, we've got a little pallet out there. Yes, all right. If we could, if we could take that pallet and if we could position that in the same area that the cat cage was in that day. Okay, there is a little angle on it to make sure. Again, for demonstrative purposes only, I would mark and offer the 13 Pallet Estates Exhibit 42-F. Okay, Mr. Cron, you have you now positioned the window in the position shown in States Exhibit 42-C? Have you positioned the litter pan in the position shown in 42-C? And have you now positioned the pallet in the same position as shown in the cat cage or whatever animal cage this is? in 42-C. Well, with the exception, this might go just a little bit more this direction here. Okay. Yes, that is within an inch or so. That is the position of the items in the photographs. Okay. If you would, I'm going to have you step around the other side of the screen for just a moment. With the screen in this cut condition, can you show the members of the jury if you wanted to open this window in this condition right here? Can you open it or can you remove the screen? Can I remove the screen? Yes, sir. Very easily. Okay. Can you demonstrate that for the jury, please? Yes, that's one way. I mean, I could have grabbed it any place to remove it. Okay. It's easy to remove. Okay. And just for the record, could you describe for the court reporter what you did in removing that screen and would you demonstrate that again, just so she can have some record of it? A moment ago, when I removed it, I grabbed the screen at the center area and just pulled outward and it popped out. Sir, when you saw the screen, States Exhibit 42-A, for the first time that day, was it still in the window in the same type of position as we see here in the courtroom today? Yes, it had not... It was not removed or missing from this window when you first saw it. Is that right? That's correct. And you have just now helped me fold the screen back inward. Was the screen still folded inward toward the garage when you first saw this screen? Yes. And the windowsill that you are talking about, can you just demonstrate here for the members of the jury where you saw the dust on the windowsill using this windowsill? Yes, the dust I saw on the windowsill was from the edge of the window to the other edge of the window. The entire length and breadth, the length and width of the windowsill on top of the windowsill. Mr. Greg Davis then says, Your Honor, at this time it may be necessary to reposition this window just slightly. But what we would like to do is we would now like to bring out Chris Frosch to the courtroom for the purpose of demonstration and in the process, we will move this window. The court then says, thank you. Go ahead. Please do so. And at this time, Mr. Frosch enters the courtroom. And the court then says, let the record reflect that Mr. Chris Frosch has entered the courtroom and is now standing with Mr. Davis. And Mr. Davis continues, all right, let's make sure we have everything positioned right again. All right. Okay. Again, for the record, Mr. Cron, after we moved the window, did you reposition the pallet and the litter pan to correspond with the location shown in States Exhibit 42-C? Yes. The window opening itself, 
still corresponds to what you see here in States Exhibit 42-C also? Yes. Okay. At this time, I'm going to ask that Mr. That Officer Frosch, starting here on the inside portion, closest to the council table, and if the record could reflect, he is just wearing slacks, a dress shirt, and a tie. He is not wearing a coat, and he is also not wearing his weapon at this time. And I am going to ask now that he now attempt to go through this window from the inside portion outward toward the jury. And would y'all like to come around here wherever you can see best? Mr. Mulder then says, that is okay. The court says, okay. The witness says, would you like me to take the stand again? Mr. Greg Davis says, no, right here is fine. The court then says, all right, if you are ready to do the demonstration, let's do it. Mr. Greg Davis says, okay. At this time, again, if you will just repeat that one more time, Mr. Frosch. And Mr. Chris Frosch then says, okay. Mr. Greg Davis says, Mr. Frosch, this time I'm just going to ask one more attempt here. This time, instead of straddling the window as you go out, I'd like for you to go out this window head first. If you would please do that. You didn't know that when I called you up here, did you? Mr. Frosch says, no. Mr. Greg Davis says, all right, okay. Mr. Mulder then says, could you give him a little running room? The court then says, all right. Mr. Greg Davis says, okay, all right. All right, thank you, Mr. Frosch. The court then said, is that it? Mr. Greg Davis says, yes, that is it. And the court says, all right. And Mr. Douglas Mulder of the defense team says, judge, could we have the record reflect that he didn't touch the sill as he went through either time? The court then says, the record will so reflect. Mr. Douglas Mulder says, thank you. And the court then says, all right. Mr. Greg Davis then continues his questioning. Just a couple of questions, Mr. Cron. In your opinion about no intruder came into this house, has that opinion changed, sir? Uh, no. Mr. Cron, just one other thing. The bloody footprints that you saw on the kitchen floor, did you have one-to-one -one photographs of those footprints taken? I did. So they are life-size now? Yes. Did you compare those against inked impressions of the footprints of the defendant in this case? I did. Okay. Mr. Cron, let me show you what's been marked as state's exhibits 44-A and 44-B. First, those two, do they truly and accurately depict bloody footprints on the kitchen as they appeared on June 6, 1996? They do. The state's exhibits 44-C and 44-D are those one-to-one -one photographs that you had made of those bloody footprints, sir? Yes. State's exhibit 44-E and 44-F are those inked impressions of footprints that were given to you by the Rowlett Police Department for comparison purposes? Yes. Mr. Cron, if you will just step down here for just a moment at this time. Find a space here and talk about these exhibits. If you will stand over here, right over here with me kind of angled, let me know if you cannot see this. Okay, let's look at the top two photographs. Are those, again, photographs taken of the kitchen floor? Yes. Okay, the one-to-ones that you had states exhibit 44-C. Is that a one-to-one -one that you had taken of the footprints shown in 44-A. Yes, it's an enlargement to where it's shown at its true size, okay? And the enlargement, the one-to-one -one that is shown in 44-D, is that a one-to-one -one enlargement of the bloody footprint shown in 44-B? Yes, that is the true size of the footprint shown in the top of the photo, too. All right, now, did you, in fact, compare the one-to-one -one footprints shown in 44-C to the left foot inked impression of the defendant shown in State's Exhibit 44-E? Yes. Do you have a ridge detail and those types of things on footprints, too? You can have. Yes, all feet have ridge formations. All right. Was there enough detail left in this bloody imprint here in 44-C to make that kind of comparison? No. What kind of comparison were you able to make between 44-C and 44-E? 
I had to do a shape comparison based on measurements, size, design, and pattern. Okay. What conclusions or opinions did you form after you compared 44-C and 44-E? In my opinion, the bloody footprint in 44-C is consistent in all aspects with being the same size and design and pattern as the left footprint of Darley Routier, and that is Exhibit 44-E. They are the same in all respects. Okay, let's go to 44-D and 44-F then. Again, did you make the same type of comparison between those two exhibits? I did. Was there enough ridge detail to make a, you know, a complete match with States Exhibit 44-D? There was not. Okay. What conclusions or opinions did you form then after you compared 44-D and 44-F? In my opinion, the bloody footprint in 44-D is consistent in all aspects of being the same footprint in 44-F, which is the bare left bare footprint of the defendant. Okay, thank you, sir. Let me ask you, on the garage door there at 5801 Eagle, what condition was the door in when you first saw it? The overhead garage door? Yes, sir. It was shut and latched. Okay. When Officer Frosch went through this window, would you categorize him as moving quickly through this window, sir? Not quickly. I think he was being careful. Okay. Now, was it your understanding that the intruder, when he went through this window, that he was doing that in a lighted courtroom? No. Okay. What was your understanding about the conditions there in the garage when this intruder went through this window out? He was fleeing the scene where he had stabbed three people, then dropped a weapon to literally arm one of the survivors of this attack. And so he armed somebody that was behind him and he was fleeing the scene. Okay. Based on your experience, would you expect that intruder to very carefully straddle or climb through this window in an effort to exit the house? Not at all. How would you expect the intruder to leave? He would probably go through there so fast, it didn't matter if the screen was cut or not. He left the scene. Did you ever find any evidence out there that an intruder had entered that house and killed those two children? No. What kind of surface would you characterize this window ledge as? Is this smooth? What sort of surface is this right down here where Officer Hamilton found these prints? It was a, it wasn't smooth. It wasn't that rough. It was between smooth and rough. It was a rough surface. Okay, when you had these prints lifted here and you didn't have any more prints lifted anywhere else that you could compare to, what did you think then? I didn't feel like they were the intruders, but they weren't bloody. I just had no real opinion on them at all outside of they were just some prints that we needed to compare. Okay, this window screen here, would it be fair to say that the cut as seen in the screen today lies below where this window frame is open to? It did. All right. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. And at this point, the court then calls um, Mr. Mulder to do his cross-examination. And during this time, it's actually coming up on 11 o'clock. And so there's some discussion about whether or not to just go ahead with the cross-examination at this point, because Mr. Mulder indicates that he's going to take quite a bit of time. The court then says, well, I think we ought to just go on. We're going to have to go ahead now. And Mr. Mulder then agrees, and he says, let's go ahead. The court says, all right. And then Mr. Greg Davis pipes up, and he says, if I could, if I could have just one more question. And Mr. Mulder then says, all right. And at this point, Mr. Greg Davis then again, gets up and asks um, a question and says, Mr. Cron, let me ask you, sometime after your initial walkthrough of the garage, if you ever saw blood on the floor of that garage, did I ever see blood? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. About what time was that? Oh, I may be off a little bit. Noon, one o'clock, two o'clock. I don't recall exactly. 
Was that blood on the garage floor when you first made your walkthrough? No. Do you have an opinion as to how it got out there in the garage? Yes. What is your opinion, sir? One of the crime lab people or officers tracked it out there during the walk, during their investigations. Okay. Mr. Greg Davison says, that's all I have. Thank you. Pass the witness. At this point, um, Mr. Mulder of Darley's defense team then gets up and begins his questioning. Mr. Mulder then kind of continues along this line, and he says, Did you determine who had tracked that blood out there? No, sir. What sort of blood did you find there in the garage? Later on in the day? Yes, sir. It was a, what would be called a smear from a, apparently a shoe, since it was on the garage floor. It was very visible. It was very visible, was it? Yes. And you just found one? Yes. Whereabouts in the garage was it? Coming out of the door leading into the utility room, it was several feet into the garage. There was a little child's, I want to say chalkboard, but not a chalkboard, the board that you can write on with grease pencils or something laying there. And it was sort of to the right of that, several feet inside the entry. Was it several steps from the utility room into the garage? Yes. Okay. And you just found the one shoe impression? Yes. And what did you, as a trained crime scene man, what did you make of that? Well, let me go back. When I said shoe impression, I assumed it was off of a shoe. There was no pattern to it or anything, but I thought it might have been from a shoe because it was on the floor. Okay. What I thought was they stepped in one of the drops that had been in the utility room, got a drop on their foot when they stepped out walking and it slid off or sloughed off or smeared off. When was it that you saw that? About, it was after the crime lab people arrived, I want to say between one and two, no, noon and two, somewhere in there. So is it fair to say that to make that is that is a transfer stain i guess isn't it yes okay to make that transfer stain the blood at least someplace would still have had to have been wet yes that makes sense doesn't it yes sir okay now i would also and this was several steps into the garage was it yes i didn't measure it because it wasn't there earlier but it was about two feet, maybe in that area, three, three at most. Do you have any explanation for why we didn't see it before if it's three or four feet into the garage? It wasn't there. I mean, are you suggesting that someone hopped on one foot and then put the other foot down? No, I have no idea how it got there outside of. It was not there for hours, and then it was there later when we walked out. It doesn't make sense that they hopped in there and then put their foot down, does it? No, not at all. No, I don't think they were acting that way. But you didn't see the first footprint and then the second one, did you? No, I did not. Okay. And it would seem to me if, in fact, they had stepped on a blood stain or spot that was still wet in the utility room, you could walk back to the utility room and it would be apparent. Well, you mean a smeared drop? Yes. Well, unless they picked up a small drop on one shoe and then they stepped out on the non-bloody shoe and the next step was the bloody spot and that might have left it several feet out. No, but what I'm saying is I would think that it would be apparent in the utility room that someone had stepped down and smashed one of those blood drops. Oh, yes, yes, it should be apparent. Well, did you go back and look? Um, no. I mean, well, why not? Because the blood was placed there long after our arrival and inspection. We were through doing the blood inspection at the garage at that time the drop was found in there. Well, how do you know you hadn't just overlooked it? Because I don't overlook things that are so obvious. This was a, I do, I don't. Okay, that's my job. All right. You have, speaking of your job, of course, you and I go way back, don't we? Yes. You started with the sheriff's office about the same time I started with the district attorney's office. 
64 is when I started. 64 is when I went to work there too. But at any rate, so we have over the years worked together on many occasions, have we not? Yes, sir. Okay. And we are friends, are we not? Yes, sir. I hope we will be friends when we're through here. I'm sure after this trial here. We won't let anything like this stand in our way, will we, Jim? I haven't. All right. Now, just to go back, and did you, as I understood your credentials here, which I might say are quite impressive, but as I understood your credentials here, you had started with the Dallas PD right out of high school? Yes. Did you then, in the course of your work with the Sheriff's Office or Dallas PD, did you get your degree in police science? What type of? You mean college? Yeah. No, I did not. Did not. Okay. And you were not a Dallas police officer, were you? I was not. No. Okay. Matter of fact, you worked classifying fingerprints. Did you not? Not primarily. I was assigned to their crime scene section with Carl Day, and my job was keeper of the records, and they trained me on the fingerprints and in the police department ID. Okay and crime scene investigation. When was it that you started with the Dallas Police Department as a civilian employee? 1958, okay, August, and continued as a non-sworn civilian employee for six or so years? Six years, yes, sir, okay. And then, I believe, you said you started with the Sheriff's Office sometime in 64? That's right, in 64, okay. You would have worked in the Identification Bureau? Yes. And again, it was your forte or your principal area of responsibility to classify fingerprints. Was it not? Yes. Okay. Well, it was dual duties. Right. Crime scene and classifying prints. Okay. And at that time, it was you and Jimmy Kitchens, wasn't it? Yes. Was there anybody else in there? Yes. Who else was in there? I may forget a name, John Slovak, Sanders, a man named Sanders, Albright, Conrad, Conrad Albright, and it seems like there was one other. Well, you've got a lot of people in jail in Dallas County, aren't there? Now, there was less then. Yeah, now there's pushing. It goes up to 8,000 to 6,000 now. Okay, and to check them in and check them out, Somebody has got to compare their fingerprints so that they don't let the wrong one out, don't they? That's correct, okay? And you get a lot of, would you tell the jury, give them an idea of what you do or what you did back then with respect to fingerprints and fingerprint comparison and classifications? What I did? Yes, sir. Well, fingerprints could generally break down into two functions. One is to record the prints of inmates or people booked in the jail. And this is the old ink set where all 10 fingers are taken. They are classified and they are placed in a master fingerprint file. The other part of fingerprint deals with the identification or the processing, developing an identification of unknown prints with latent prints. Is that what you mean? Yeah, back then it was done with cards about that size, wasn't it? It generally still is, 8x8 eight eight cards, okay? And it was done manually, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, it wasn't modern like it is today at all, was it? No. Okay. So it was a laborious process, was it not? Well, I didn't enjoy it, no. And I didn't enjoy touching inmates. And Captain Kitchens was the man in charge? Yes, okay. And fair to say that in the city of Dallas or in the county of Dallas, the sheriff's primary responsibility is for the jail, is it not? Primary? Well, that is, well, he is the man in charge of the jail, the department. Yes, sir. Sure. But Dallas has probably 30 suburbs, for lack of a better word, or cities associated or cities in Dallas County that are independent units and all have their police force. Isn't that correct? Not in 1964. That only came later, and we lost some cities that were swallowed up by bigger cities. I understand. But generally speaking, they have their own police departments, yes. Okay, by and large, the sheriff of Dallas County's responsibility is to maintain the jail, 
and to make sure the right people are going in and out and to patrol the unincorporated areas of Dallas County. Is that not correct? Well, not entirely. Well, I mean, that's 99% of it, isn't it? Not really. He has warrants, civil warrants, criminal warrants. He has the criminal investigation division. The patrol has a contract. You know, at times they vary. They had several cities they contracted with to supply patrols. And now it's, I believe, just one, which is Sunnyvale. Mm -hmm. But at one time, they also had all the patrol for Cedar Hill. And there was a contract with Segoville, too, at one time. They even had several substations in about four areas of the county. At this point in time, in 1997, it's primarily jail with less patrol activity. But that has only come about in the past, oh, six, seven, or eight years. Yes, sir. But back in 1964, even in 64 and 70, 75, whatever, there was not a great deal of Dallas County that was not incorporated. Was there? No. Unincorporated? No. There wasn't that much unincorporated. And the sheriff, other than the contracts that the sheriff had with these little municipalities that didn't, it was just more economical to have the sheriff do it for them to hire their own police force and give them benefits and that sort of thing, wasn't it? Well, up to a point, they couldn't hire their own. They didn't have separate crime scene units. We had to help them on their major crime scenes and all of their investigations. Sure, but we're just talking about the little ones, aren't we? Garland, Mesquite, Richardson, Carrollton, the ones that I didn't help during my career down there would basically be the Dallas Police Department. For example, the Dallas Police Department probably, during your career, Lieutenant, probably the biggest, maybe most offensive deal in your department would have been the murder of a deputy sheriff in the Trinity River Bottoms. That was actually handled by the Dallas Police Department. No, I know that. That is the point I'm making. What was your question? I said that was probably the biggest case with that involved officers in the Dallas Sheriff's Office. Being killed? Yes. Mm-hmm. We have had other officers killed that I have investigated. We have had one killed there in the building. Right. Right outside the Sheriff's Office, didn't you? Right. Several. If you are talking about what I have investigated, oh, no or what the section, because I have, no, I am just pointing out that even in a case of that magnitude, where three deputy sheriffs were killed, you didn't handle the crime scene search. It was handled by Dallas PD, was it not? Oh, yes, it was in their city. Yes, sir. So you didn't help and assist, as a general rule, the Dallas Police Department, do you? No. Okay, they have their own crime scene search unit, which I dare say they think is probably superior to anybody's, with the exception of Kerrville's. They probably think that. I mean, there's a pride in their own unit, and they don't, for lack of a better way to phrase it, they probably don't feel like they need your help. Well, only on high-tech material, they would bring us some of their work on processing items for latent prints that they couldn't handle. Well, you have got the ovens down there and the paraphernalia where you can process with the super glue and so on and so forth. You can handle those things? Well, they have that. We used some higher, other higher tech lasers. We have the Venta hoods for the fuming and using chemical processes. Okay, but other than assistance in, say, fingerprints, they had their own crime scene search unit, which was well manned, was it not? Yes, I didn't go down and help the Dallas Police Department on their homicides. Okay, and the city of Garland, for example, now is probably 200,000, as is Irving and Richardson and Mesquite, aren't they? They are the second largest city, I believe, in Dallas County. Okay, but those municipalities, those four municipalities, probably account for about, what, 40% of Dallas County? I don't know. When I retired, they hired me as a consultant to work to revamp their crime scene section for them and assist them on several murders. Right after I retired, they told me that they were second largest, and I don't know anymore. Okay, well, 
Is it fair to say that Dallas County is about 2 million right now? I don't know. Probably is. Yes. Well, you live there, don't you? Yeah, well, I don't care about population. How many is it? Okay. 2 million? It might be 2 million or 100,000. I don't know. All right. The city of Dallas is about half of that. Okay. Garland, Richardson, Mesquite, Irving, probably seven or 800,000. I will accept your figures. I don't know. Well, when we talk about, for example, you attended the FBI school. Well, not the main academy. I attended their advanced latent print development and comparison course. Okay, so that I'm not a graduate of the FBI Academy. No. All right. I didn't know whether you left that impression or not. Oh, no. But you attended. You didn't graduate from the FBI Academy. Oh, no. You attended a special school that dealt with fingerprints. Yes. One there and then several that they conducted in Dallas County, but not the National Academy. No. All right. And as you would attend these schools, they would give you an award, wouldn't they? Award? Yes. No, that was the certificate of attendance that I attended the school and passed or whatever, you know. It's proof that I went. If you just, and that was important. It's important when you get up and testify that you've attended, I guess, the best known school is probably the FBI school, isn't it? Well, for two reasons, for testifying and also the knowledge you gain from attending such schools. Sure, DPS has a school, don't they, down in Austin? Yes, right. And they can also, on occasion, have schools in satellite places, can't they? Yes, okay. And you have attended DPS, I dare say, have you not? Yes. Over the years? Yes. In fingerprint comparison? On fingerprint? No. Okay. Other schools, but not that one. Okay. Did you prepare a report in this case? Yes. Okay. Do you have it with you? At this point, Mr. Greg Davis says, I have got it. Mr. Mulder, the witness, James Cron, and says he has it. And Mr. Mulder then again starts his questioning. All right. You told us about 2,100 crime scenes that you had. Excuse me. 21,000, I believe it was, crime scenes that you have attended over the years. Is that right? Partly. I said 21,000 civil and criminal offenses I have been involved with in the last 39 years. What, do you have a little business on the side where you handle some civil cases or something? As favors to people, it's not a contract. I make enough money in retirement. I don't need the work. But I have, I do a consulting business, okay? And that is, that would be the civil, that would be aside from your duties and responsibilities there in the sheriff's office, wouldn't it? Yes, there are several cases that came out of criminal offenses. Suicides, where one side is saying it was probably a homicide, that type of civil case. This is a deal where you... Are you telling the jury that these are cases where you made an appearance on the scene? Some of them, yes. Some of them you just consulted on? Some, well, it varies. Sometimes I go to the scene. Sometimes they bring, they will bring me items. Sometimes I will go to their facility. It depends on the case and what they want me to do. Okay. It could be anything from a bicycle theft or breaking into a car to a double axe murder. Well, I'm not trying to be facetious. I don't handle the little ones. I just send them to other people. If it's not what I would consider an interesting double axe case, I don't take them. Well, you're not in a position to pick and choose in the sheriff's office, are you? I mean, if somebody has, oh, I was then. Then I wasn't. But I thought you talking about when I retired. No, no, I'm talking about when you were with the sheriff's office. Oh, gosh, then... It could be an egg thrown on a car. Yeah, it could be most anything, couldn't it? Yes. And these are cases, when you say 21,000, you are talking about cases that you have consulted on, cases that you have gone to the scene, cases where people have come to you, you have gone to them, things of that nature. Every case that I have been involved with, whether it's just as you described, that I somehow had a part in, 
either at the scene or consulted or they brought me evidence. You are correct. How did you arrive at that estimation? Well, for years, the Sheriff's Department for 29 years, we kept annual statistics. As you know, working for the county and working with commissioners and budgets, we had to justify all of our equipment. So we kept a record of every call or everything that was brought to our office by way of case and crime. And for 29 of those years, the statistics kept that way. And I knew what I was involved in. Since I retired, of course, naturally, I am the only one and I have my own logbook and I register my crimes. The city of Dallas ones, there's less. I personally, being a civilian employee, they took me under their wing to show me all of this crimes, all crime scene procedures, but I really couldn't get involved in that aspect or handle their evidence. I was just sort of like a trainee where they took me under their wing showed me how to class prints, take pictures, and do the... But I didn't count those Dallas police ones. Okay. Speaking of taking pictures, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here too much, but did you educate the Rowlett Police Department on how to take pictures? No. Okay. I talked to them about on some of the little schools I have taught for them. Right. I have told them what to shoot, but as far as use of a camera, I didn't teach them that. Okay. Well, when you were telling them what to shoot, did you tell them to make a log of their photographs? No, I did not. Okay. Well, then you didn't attend the FBI school on crime scene search? Referring to, no, I didn't. Okay. So you wouldn't know that the FBI, the first thing the FBI recommends is that you take pictures and that you log them. Well, the FBI recommends a lot of things that is not law or rules. It's recommendations similar to their points on fingerprint comparison. It's a guideline is all. Did you know that Maine took some 12 or 14 rolls of film in this case? Not how many. I knew he took quite a few pictures. Would it surprise you that he didn't keep contact sheets or have contact sheets made or that he didn't even number the rolls of film so you could tell which one or what order they were taken in. I would say surprise. I don't know if that is the right word. I would say that a contact sheet should have been made for referral purposes. How would that help us? It actually helps everybody all down the line from the beginning of the offense just to be able to look at a contact sheet and say, well, this is what we shot the first day. This is what we shot later. It's easier than sorting through your negatives and finding them. Yes, sir. It's a record-keeping procedure. I believe it was your recommendation, Lieutenant, that they take photographs first. Is that right? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, and of course you had walked the scene, so to speak, had you not? I did. And in your entourage, as you walked through, there were some, I guess there were four of you, weren't there? Yes, all right, and we can agree that in the course of your years, there were very few crime scenes that you have seen that have not been contaminated to some degree. I would have to ask for an explanation on what you, what I mean by contamination? Yes, I mean, I'll be glad to answer. I just need to know. Yes, is it rare not to find? Well, let me just ask it another way. Perhaps that was unartful. Is it rare not to see contamination in a crime scene to some degree? Let me clarify, before or after the arrivals of the officers? Well, I think it would be after the arrival of the officers. Well, what occurs quite often after the arrival of the first officer, and I'm going to have to narrow this down to a violent scene as opposed to a burglary, if that's okay. Suit yourself. Okay, well... Because there's less problems with a non-violent situation where you have, say, a burglary of a store, but on violent situations, you have what we call the first arrivals, the responding officers. And since they are in a violent situation where people are injured, their primary concern is care for the survivors, medical attention, or possibly suspects at the scene. You will get some initial walking through a scene if that is the type of situation that something could be stepped on. 
you get a little of that, I mean, it's inevitable. Human life is more important than evidence up to a point. Exactly. And there is the point. But once the situation is contained or the scene is contained, I have seen in most instances where, you know, the medical personnel arrived, people are being cared for, and then it's time for the crime scene officers to arrive. Things settle down, and then you have less destruction or, you know, tamperings. Tampering always implies to me on purpose or trying to change things. But you have less damage of evidence once the initial emergency is over with. Yes, sir. But to be honest, some could occur right at first. Well, we have gone all around Robin Hood's barn, but the bottom line is you are saying, yes, there is contamination. It's possible. It's not always. That would be a blanket statement, but the risk is there at any scene when the first officers arrive. Yes, sir. And of course, the risk is also there that the scene has been contaminated and you, as a crime scene search man, don't realize that, isn't it? That's true. Yes, sir. Okay. You have seen evidence kicked around, haven't you? Yes. You have seen spent shell casings, shell cartridges, cases, kicked around, haven't you? I have. You have seen glass kicked around, haven't you? Yes. And you know, one thing that I thought was curious, it was your recommendation that Moyne, Maine, excuse me, that Maine photograph the scene first? Yes. Okay. Have you looked at the photographs that he took? I have seen most of the, yes, sir, I have. Fair to say, if he took, if there were 24 shots to a roll and he took 10, 12, 14, he would have taken some 300 pictures. Very likely, yes. Maybe more? Yes, okay. And did you notice that his pictures, you know, he didn't stand in the corner of a room and shoot the room like this? Did you notice that? I did notice that, yes and then moved to maybe another place in the room and shoot panoramic, and then move to another corner and other places and shoot from the boundaries of that room? I noticed he did not do that. That would have been a good idea, wouldn't it? Yes, it would have been. And for two reasons, wouldn't it? Yes, at least. Well, yes. I mean, we can think of two reasons. One, it would be a lot clearer and perhaps when you put these pictures together, you don't have what looks like a jigsaw puzzle? Correct. That would be one reason. And two, if he is taking 300 shots and he is just shooting what he thinks is important, then he is walking around and every time he takes a step and every time he takes a shot and every time he goes through every place in that deal, he is, he risks contaminating the scene, doesn't he? Walking through it here again, the word contaminated, if he is watching where he walks and he is shooting pictures and stands still when he shoots and looks where he's walking, I don't know if he would contaminate it. Did you look at the bottoms of his shoes to see if he had blood on the bottoms of his shoes when he finished shooting his shots? No. Did you look on the bottoms of his shoes to see if he had glass shards on the bottom of his shoes when he finished shooting the shots? No, I did not. That would have at least told us whether or not he stepped in blood and stepped in glass, would it not? Well, I don't know about the glass. The blood, there would have been bloody footprints on the tile, you know, the kitchen floor and the other parts of the house where we walked, like to go out the front door. We would walk around to where the dining room was to avoid going through the bloody hall. There were no bloody footprints in there, so I can only assume he didn't have bloody shoes on when he walked that way. Or he wiped his feet on the carpet, and you can see a great deal of traffic on that carpet, can't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. And as a matter of fact, you know, one reason that you rope off a crime scene, police get in there, and they are naturally curious, aren't they? Yes, they are. Everybody wants to handle the gun, don't they? Well, they want to look at it, at least. They want to get out there, look at that gun, maybe pick it up. Then if they have touched it, 
and realized what they have done, they try to put it right down where it was, don't they? Well, I hope an officer wouldn't do that. I know it. And you hope an officer wouldn't touch the inside of this window, don't you? I mean, maybe leave some prints while they are doing it? Yes, sir. I would hope they wouldn't. You would hope they wouldn't, but you had the entire force out there printed, did you not? Yes. You just didn't take their word for it, I take it? No, I didn't take their word. And why is that? I wanted to eliminate the prints. Exactly. And the only way you could do it is you can't just ask them and say, Hey guys, nobody's going to admit being that foolish, are they? Right. That has been your experience, hasn't it? Yes, that's right. Sure. And the same thing about the shoes? What? Everybody is going to deny it, aren't they? What about the shoes? Shoes are touching the fooling with the gun or fooling with an obvious contaminating an obvious entry or exit. Well, I saw that they didn't touch the entry and or exit, the supposed one, because I made a comparison. By the same token, I know they didn't walk through the blood, leaving their bloody shoe prints everywhere all through the house. You don't know whether some of the prints that you could not identify are those of police officers, do you? I have no idea whose prints those are. Exactly. So that we can be real clear on this. As far as the, I'll call them coincidental prints on the window, okay, for lack of a better word, that isn't what I would call them, but you can call them what you want. They're un unidentified prints. Unidentified prints, yes. Suffice it to say that they are suitable for comparison purposes, aren't they? Yes. They are difficult, but they can be compared. Exactly. Basically, what we have are two prints, don't we? As I testified, five lifts, two prints. Well, yes, right. One of them is, oh, yeah, as far as two prints, right. One of them, I'm not sure if it's the finger or palm, it's so bad, but yes, there's two prints unidentified. How much of those prints, just give the jury some idea of the area, how much of those prints was suitable for comparison purposes? Oh, that is, that is a tough one. Yeah, I have to measure it. It's an elongated print. I'm trying to, maybe a yellow number two pencil. If you can imagine the width of a pencil and possibly an inch and a half section of that pencil, that width and length would be about the size of the print. Okay. And there are enough points of the way you, as an expert, identify the print. You look at a known print and then you look at an unknown print and you see if there are enough common areas of identification so that you are comfortable in saying that that print was made by this particular hand. That's correct. How many points of identification do you require? Do I personally require? Yes. I can't come up with an exact total because it depends on the quality of the print. But basically eight, nine or more points. Okay. How many points of identification did you see in these two unknown prints? Oh, the coincidental prints. I'm not going to count points that were pushing it because this, I would say 10 or 11. Just you are right on that edge then, I guess. All right. Of comfort level. Right. Enough to where if I found the 10 or 11 points in a known set that in my opinion, it would have been a positive identification. And this would be true. Is this true of both prints or is this just the one? Both of them. Both of them. Yes. And about how much area wise was the second coincidental print? It was kind of the shape of it. Here again, I'm trying to think of a description. It was a little wider on one end and it tapered down sort of like a long teardrop effect about two inches wide and I'm sorry, two inches long and maybe a half inch wide and it tapered down to possibly an eighth of an inch wide. Okay, and you found 9 or 10 or 11 points of identification in that print as well. Right, 
without looking at it again and counting them, but the best of my knowledge, it was about that area, 11 points or 10 points. Okay, could you compare them with each other and see if they were made by the same person? I tried that, but I don't know if they were made by the same person. In that case, the same person would have had to touch both areas in exactly the same part of their hand. Yes. And so it could be the same person, but I couldn't prove it. Okay. I did try though. Did you incidentally, just in talking about this, did you notice how the officer, when he went through there, where he put his hands? Then? Yes. I didn't watch him. Okay. I mean, I was watching his feet. I was not watching his hands. You saw that he didn't, I don't know whether there was just dust there or not, but you saw that he didn't touch the sill. I saw that. You said that there was a print in the shoe print or a partial shoe print in the middle of that kitchen floor. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And where exactly was that? Here again, I don't know the exact measurements. It was heading towards the utility room approximately halfway past the island, the counter that sat out in the middle of the kitchen, and the utility room door somewhere in that area. Would you suspect then that would be a result of contamination? It might be a matter of semantics, but it was, I mean, somebody stepped in the blood? In that case, yes, an officer had to step in some of the blood from where, I do not know if it was in the living room or kitchen, but an officer stepped in the blood at the scene and transferred that to the kitchen floor. All right. And you say that was around the island. Is that right? A little past the island heading to the utility room. Okay. At this point, the court says, Mr. Mulder, let's go ahead and break now until 10 minutes after one o'clock, please. Thank you very much. So at this point, I'm going to cut it off here. And in the next episode, we will pick up with the questioning of James Cron. So in this episode, we finish hearing from the prosecution, and we actually start to hear from Darley's defense team. First, though, let's cover what the prosecution wrapped up with in this episode of testimony. So they have this, the actual window that was from the garage. They have this actual window here in court. And as the prosecution, Greg Davis, is asking James Cron questions, he has him come down off of the witness stand and demonstrate a few things with the window. And one of them is to lift the window to the approximate height that he saw it when he originally arrived at the scene. And there's this whole setup that they have this pallet there that was is supposed to represent the tall animal cage near the window. And Cron is asked if you know, this is in the right position. And if it was the way that he originally saw it, and then he just makes sure that it's at the right angle. He, Kron is, if you haven't discovered by now, he is exceptionally detailed and does at times tend to really over explain things. He is then asked by the prosecutor to remove the screen and Kron mentions twice how easy it is to take out of this window. He then points out, he being crying, he then points out to the jury where he saw the dust on the windowsill, which, you know, in my opinion, should have been a self-explanatory. You know, you have dust on a windowsill, but it is a murder trial, so you have to be really, really detailed. What they then decide to do is to bring in Rowlett officer Chris Frosch into the courtroom to demonstrate something. Now, if you're wondering why Chris Frosch, and while it's never explicitly stated, he was the one who Darley picked out when trying to describe what the intruder looked like. And she happened to mention that the man was about the same size as Chris, Chris Frosch. So then Greg Davis, the prosecutor, he then has Frosch go through this window from the inside, so pretending you were inside the garage, out. And evidently, Frosch straddled this window when he was going through it. 
He's then asked to go through it again from the opposite direction, and this time to do it head first. Now, Mr. Mulder of Darley's defense team asked the court to make a record of the fact that neither time that Frosch went through the window, he never touched the windowsill. Kron then makes it a point to say that essentially this intruder wouldn't even be doing what Officer Frosch did, that the intruder would have been in a hurry and it would have been dark and it would have been, wouldn't have been in a lighted courtroom, etc. Which to me kind of thinks, well, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose then of going through this whole demonstration, right? If he was supposed to reenact the intruder's movements, why wouldn't the courtroom have been dimmed? Why wouldn't Frosch have gone through the window quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So just as Kron is being passed to the defense team, Davis asks the judge if he can have one more question and the judge grants it. And then he asks Kron if he ever saw blood on the floor in the garage after his initial walkthrough. He said he did and then he says that it was around noon or one o'clock or two o'clock he couldn't re recall exactly he does say that it was not there when he made his initial walkthrough and then he says he believes that someone working the scene must have tracked it in so at this point it then goes on to the defense cross-examination and Mulder continues along this line of questioning and James Cron says that this print that was in the garage that he noticed later after his initial walkthrough was quote unquote very visible and that he only found the one print. Now this print was according to Cron several feet into the garage. It was near a child's toy that was like a chalkboard. He then says that he saw this after the crime lab folks arrived and then again says it was around noon, one, two, between noon and two. Now Mulder points out that in order to make this particular print, the blood would have obviously had to have been wet. And this print was two feet, three feet at most into the garage. Now Kron then takes it, this explanation of this, this bloody print, uh, that the that it must have come from a blood drop or something that must have gotten on someone's shoe and as they're in the garage it somehow got on the bottom of this person's shoe and created a print I mean I'm still trying to follow along with this I don't know <laughs> personal opinion I don't know that a blood drop on your shoe sliding off would then cover the entire sole of a portion even a portion of your print and then end up on a floor somewhere. So then Kron is asked by Mulder that if this print came from the utility room, there should be some kind of evidence of that. But Kron gets a little confused at this point. When he does finally understand what Mulder is trying to ask him, he's asked if he went back and checked where it might have come from. And he says he never did that because it happened after they had already done their initial walkthrough or their initial inspection. Now, Kron is a pretty detailed guy, as you can tell by many of his responses, if you've lis listened up to this far. So this seems really out of character to me that he wouldn't have gone back and actually checked that. He then gets a bit defensive when he's asked if maybe he just overlooked it. And he said that, oh, he wouldn't do such a thing because it's his job. We then find out, which was kind of a surprise to me, that James Cron and Mulder, the defense attorney, know each other very well and even consider themselves friends and go as far as he even goes as far as to use Cron's name that Mulder knows him as, which is just Jim. Now, Mulder is going over his educational, Cron's educational background. And there's a lot of talk about the Dallas Police Department and other smaller police departments in the suburbs and such. I couldn't really see what he was getting at with going all over this information until it was pointed out that the larger Dallas Police Department, it was very unlikely that they would ever have needed James Cron's services. Although 
he did say, Kron did say sometimes they did. So then they moved on to Kron's educational experience, especially with the FBI, and how his former explanation when he was going over his education, when he first made it on the stand, of course, with the prosecution, having him relay all of this, made it sound like he had actually graduated from the FBI Academy in Quantico, which he did not. Mulder then continues and wants the jury to understand that these 21,000 cases that Kron said he was involved in weren't exactly all homicides or something even similar to what happened in Rowlett. The questioning then moves on to how to take proper photographs at a crime scene. And he was asked if he told the Rowlett Police Department how to take photos while they were on the scene. Now, he said that he didn't, but Mulder then mentions to James Cron that Officer Maine had taken about 12 to 14 rolls of pictures in the crime scene and didn't create a contact sheet for them. And James Cron was very surprised at this. There have been a couple of mentions of contact sheets within the testimony so far. And I personally wasn't 100% sure what they meant by that in regards to a crime scene. So here is the explanation in case you aren't sure as well. It's essentially like a photo album page that's filled with small versions of all the photos that have been taken at a scene. It allows someone to look at the photos and quickly see where they were taken, etc. Now, Kron evidently had suggested that the Rowlett Police Department first take photos of the scene as it was. There, we also learned that there were four of them who, quote unquote, walked the scene. Mulder further talks about contamination of the crime scene, just how it's inevitable if there are this many officers and other personnel. And James Cron does agree with this. He then says something about going all around, quote unquote, Robin Hood's barn. I had no idea what this meant, so I looked it up. And essentially, it means that someone has taken a very long, indirect, or roundabout route to get to a point or a destination. So if you didn't know like I did, there you go. Mulder then turns back to the photos that Maine, Officer Maine, had taken. And there were about 300 of them. And none of them were taken from the proper location, like a corner of the room. And this is when he mentions the pictures being a jigsaw puzzle within the testimony. And the reason for this is that many of the pictures that they're using in this trial, they all have arrows starting at one spot in one photo, which then points to another spot in another photograph. So you kind of have to butt them up against one another because the pictures are related. It's kind of you have to set them side by side or one on top of the other in order to get the full picture based on how the photos were taken. Mulder then asks if Kron had looked at the bottom of the officer's shoes to see if there was any blood or any glass adhered to them. And he said that he did not do this. He also infers that as Officer Maine is walking around taking these pictures, he's stepping all around the area and he's likely contaminating the entire crime scene. He then mentions something about that he would hope an officer wouldn't touch the window area, making even further points to the jury that the officers were essentially careless. So Kron is then asked about the fingerprints and I was curious to hear about what he had to say. He does say that two of them are unidentified. Kron also said that his personal threshold for identifying a print is eight, nine, or 10 points that match on the print. But then he goes on to say that these two unknown prints had 10 or 11 points, but he didn't feel comfortable using this to identify them. And this was true on both of the prints. This really thoroughly confused me. He gave his own threshold. But these unknowns, these unknown prints, had more than that or very close to it, and he still didn't feel comfortable with it. You know, maybe I'm misunderstanding. And if I'm misunderstanding this, then it's likely the jury probably is too, because I didn't quite see where he was going with this. He gave us a threshold. These prints met his personal threshold, but he didn't feel comfortable identifying them. That doesn't make any sense to me. 
they then talk about the there's a shoe print or a partial shoe print in the middle of the kitchen floor and it's just past the kitchen island towards walking towards the utility room door he says that it was an officer who had stepped in blood and then transferred that to the kitchen floor and essentially this is where they take their break so in the next episode we will cover the remainder of James Cron's testimony, which uh, finally wraps up with all of his information. So now all of these exhibits that I've referred to that you've heard about in this particular episode, I will share on the website at beachhouse34.com if you're interested. Now a bit of a heads up, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be transitioning to a different hosting provider for the website. So if you happen to stop by, can't reach the website or there's nothing there just rest assured it's very temporary so that's it for this episode of the darley routier trial like i said we'll be back with james cron 5 which will be the last portion of his testimony and after that we'll hear from a woman named helena and helena did some laundry and cleaning at the routier home on june 4th and 5th so just a couple of days before the crime occurred her main testimony will be about Darley's demeanor on those days. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening to this very interesting testimony in the Darley Routier trial. And I will be back soon with the last of James Cron's testimony. <laughs>